All right, let's read out of Luke chapter 17. And we're going to go ahead and read verses 11 through 21. And uh, we're going to let the Lord speak. Amen. So let's let's see what he has to say in this passage of scripture. It says and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Again, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. In other words, nobody else came to give glory to God except for this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Now I got to tell you, verses 20 and 21 are a complete different gear shift. It's happening at a different time. It's next in the chapter, but it's a new paragraph. But there's a point that I want to make right here. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? We've learned about the Pharisees before in this church. There were a group of religious leaders. You ever met a religious person that just thought they knew everything? Because, come on, somebody, help me out here. I know you've experienced that. You know, some people have studied and they know some stuff, but you can tell the difference in the spirit behind it. The spirit behind the person that's actually studied to show themselves approved because they wanted to be a disciple of the Lord so they can help other people are going to operate in a different spirit. You're not going to feel a condescension coming off of them. They're not going to be looking down their religious nose downward upon you and saying, oh, holy brother, holy sister, if you could ever just rise up to the level where I am, then you'd be floating on the clouds. No, it's a bunch of lies. That's what the Pharisee, it's a spirit of religion. Yes. The spirit of religion that says you're unworthy and you'll never be able to walk in the places where I am. But what it says right here was he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. And this is what he answered them. He said this. He said the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Now, let me just clarify that. There's going to be a day when you're going to be able to observe with your physical eyes the kingdom of God showing up on this earth. Because the word of God says that there is a wrath of God coming. Now, you know, we're, we're believing God for the blessed hope. We're believing God for the rapture of the church. Amen. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that this world is already experiencing birth pains. This world is already experiencing tribulation. And what I'm here to tell you is that it's only going to get worse before it gets better. But there's coming a day when Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, will come back on a white horse. It might sound sci-fi to you. It might seem unbelievable to you. But I'm telling you what my Bible says. My Bible says Jesus came the first time riding into town on a donkey in humility. And, but he's coming back again on a white horse with, a, with a, a host of an army behind him of both angels and the redeemed. And at the battle of Armageddon, he is going to slay those that have been against him with the sword of his mouth with his very word he will cause the earth to quake and he will cause those that have been against him to to fall and to die and it, and it says that the blood will rise in the valley up to the bridles of the horses I'm here to tell you on that day there's going to be great slaughter there's going to be great condemnation and judgment because grace will have run out Hallelujah, though. Today we have grace. Amen. Today we have grace. And the kingdom of God, and my main point to all that was that one day you're going to be able to see it. Physical eyes, we're going to be able to see it. So I don't want you to think, but, but what he's saying is, is that you're wanting to see it today. Yeah. People have a mindset of how they want the kingdom of God to look. Listen, there was a time frame, I think it was in the, you know, people want to see the manifestation of something. 
and they'll run to over here. Oh man, I hear over here he's blowing on folks, and they falling down, and they wiggling on the ground, or you know. And listen, I'm all about look. If the Holy Spirit shows up, and 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 He will slay people in His presence. I, it, it happens. It's happened to me. I know it to be true. But I'm here to tell you, there's a whole lot of times. Whenever it could be a little flesh thing. And you start blowing on people and the first one falls and they're like, oh, it's like a domino effect. We're all going to fall. I'm not trying to make fun because I don't know when it's real and when it's not. But I'm telling you right now, I hate to admit it to you, I've, I've fake failed before. Wow. Yeah. Not because I was trying to make something happen, but everybody else was falling around me. And, I just, and then the preacher was kind of like... <laughs> I remember one time the, the same preacher was trying to push on my sister like that, and she, man, she got some calves like that. <laughs> and she like, <laughs> we ain't going nowhere, buddy. This thing's going to be real or it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Anyway, people are wanting to observe something with their physical eyes, you know, and then, and then they get caught up in the hype. Oh, man, he's moving over there. Look, they're falling out. Or this is happening over there. It's moving over there. No, that's not the way G Jesus said this. It doesn't come with observation. Okay, you know what it does? The kingdom of God is within you. Yes. See, when you get saved, and this isn't even the, the majority of my message, but when you get saved, a miracle happens. Ooh, yes. Amen. You're like, well, maybe I ain't never been saved. Maybe not, brothers and sisters. I don't know because I'm not the Holy Spirit. But I can tell you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says when you yield to the truth of the gospel, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means the Holy Spirit makes your heart his home. And when the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, things start changing. Hallelujah. It's not going to stay the same. Amen. Now, can we fall backwards after we've gone forward? Yes, we can. And will God deliver and restore and make whole? Yes, he will. Amen. We just got to trust him. Praise God. So that's the kingdom of God. And listen, but I want to go back to the story of the lepers because a chain of events takes place in this story with these lepers. It says that they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Many times in order for change to take place, spiritually speaking, in our lives, there has to come a place of desperation. Because if we're honest with one another, we can say this, that really sin feels good to our flesh. Come on, somebody. We wouldn't be doing all the things that we did in the past or sometimes still tinkering around with stuff. If things, if sin didn't feel good at all to our flesh, if there was nothing exciting about it. But one of the things that I've learned through the years is, is that Satan is not only a liar, he's a deceiver. And he just says, oh, just a little pinch is going to do you. But the reality of it is it ain't never just stops at a pinch. I, can remember, I know I've shared this story before, but I can remember one time I was jogging. It was about 9 o'clock at night. And I'm jogging down the road, and they had like four people, four teenagers on the other side of the road. And this one dude had real long hair, and he was wearing a trench coat. I don't know. Maybe it was because I could remember back in the 80s, I had a trench coat on when, when I, it was, but that was before Columbine. But I had, a, I had a trench coat on, and I had long hair. And when I was jogging, and I saw them over there, I was, and I was just full of the presence of the Lord. I was just like, loving me some Jesus. And you know what? These people right here may never hear the good news of Jesus. So let me just veer on over there. So I did. I jogged over there. I said, hey, what's happening? And they're like, what? I said, look. Man, I just wanted to tell you something. I don't know what's up. I don't know what you're into. I ain't here to judge. But I'm here to tell you this. I've learned something in life. That whenever I first entered into a lifestyle of sin, it looked so good. It smelled so good. And it was just being promised that it was going to be so good. And then one day I woke up with my head in a toilet. I woke up with my with myself in the midst of a place where I was frustrated and I couldn't get free. And I had to cry out to the Lord. And when I cried out to the Lord, he delivered me. So what I'm telling you is that what, what might be fun today is not going to be fun in the future. I'm here to tell you what, what feels like you're having a good time today is going to turn into a prison tomorrow. But good news, good news. Lord, Lord, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Because when you get to that place and you cry out to the Lord, hallelujah, I'm telling you right now, a broken and a contrite spirit, he will not despise. So there's a chain of events taking place. I don't know how long these lepers have been lepers, but they tired of being lepers. Lord Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And then when he saw them, yeah, that's another chain of event. 
It's not like Jesus doesn't already know where you are and what you're going through. But sometimes, whenever you cry from that place of desperation, it causes a reverberation in the spiritual realm. You understand what I'm going, what I'm talking about? Sometimes when you and I get to that place of desperation and we're like, Lord Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. It reverberates in the spiritual realm. And Jesus is like, oh, just heard him. I've been waiting. Oh, I can tell you right now, that's scriptural. Because see, whenever he heard that Lazarus was dead, when it isn't even in my notes, but I'm here to tell you, when he heard that Lazarus was dead, the word of God says he waited three more days. Because Jesus, many times we think we're done before we're really done. And the Lord's like, no, I'm going to wait till you're three day dead. I'm going to wait till you're three day dead. And when you get desperate and you cry out and I feel that reverberation in the spiritual realm, I'm going to take notice of the plight of your situation. And I'm going to rush to you and I'm going to allow my light to flame in the midst of darkness. And I'm going to cause you to rise up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's good. The title of my message this morning is as they went, they were cleansed. And I want you to know that that was the next thing in this chain of events. As they went. They were cleansed. What what are you talking about? I'm just saying that sometimes at some point when the Lord speaks and we hear his voice, we got to get up and we got to get moving in the right direction. That's part of repentance. You know, did you know that the that the really the the definition of repentance in the Greek dictionary is to change the mind and to go in a different direction? Listen to me, the world will train you. Hear hear me close, Christian. Hear me close, church. The world will train you. It will bring you to its preschool. It will bring you to its elementary school. It will put you in its high school. It will even try to bring you to its university. What are you talking about? I'm trying to say the world will train you according to its ways. It will convince you to think the way that it desires for you to think. It will begin to change your mindset And everything that it changes your mindset to will be contrary to the word of God. But what I'm here to tell you is this, is that when your mind, when your mindset lines up with the word of God, when you change your mind and you come to the realization, no, it was sin. Hello, Christian. Come on. No, it was sin. See, as a matter of fact, the first time I walked in that church and that preacher started talking about that this was sin, I didn't like it. It didn't feel good to me. Guess what? Hello, brothers and sisters. I was demon spirits trying to mess with you, jangling with you, wrangling with you, and trying to convince you to get up and walk out. Your flesh didn't like it because the truth was being told. But when your mind lines up with the mind of God and you say, yes, Lord, I need a mind change. That was sin. That was leading me into darkness. That was keeping me stuck. It was keeping me in a leprous condition. It was keeping sin, keeping me all bound up in sin. Hallelujah. Whenever, whenever they got up and they began to walk, when they moved in the direction, they were cleansed. Just start walking. Amen. Amen. I know that it's easier said than done. Listen, we really need the Holy Spirit to show up. Sometimes to pick us up so that we can walk. But sometimes that little desperate cry will start it. When you ain't got nothing else but a whimper. Listen to me. When you ain't got nothing else but a whimper. Praise God. I heard this story one time. Brother Swagger was talking about the fact that whenever he was, uh, I don't remember exactly when it was in his life, but he he had a dream. It was like, it was really kind of, to me, it sounded almost like sleep paralysis. He didn't use that wording, but where he was in the limbo state and there was like this huge bear with these claws with this horrible roar and it had him pinned. And the, the thing, it was basically the enemy. And he was saying, I have you now. I have you. Basically he was saying, I'm going for the kill shot. And there's nothing that you can do because you're paralyzed under my power. And you're not going to be able to get out of this. And there was nothing that you could do. This thing was, and and the only thing that he knew to do was to whisper the name of Jesus. And when he did it, he just whispered it with with his lips. And when he did, it was like a breath of the Holy Spirit took that thing. And it was like it was just rolling, flipping backwards. 
out of the scene because the power of the Holy Spirit is so much more powerful than the power of darkness. And even though sometimes we find ourselves bound in the power of darkness, once again, it just takes that little whimper, that little cry to start off and then the Holy Spirit will show up to help you. Yes. He'll do something in the yes. spiritual realm that you can't see, but yet at the same time, you know something's different about yes. this. Amen. This isn't me doing it in my own strength. This is the Holy Ghost showing up. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, if Christians would, would never struggle, this iPad's acting up today. Just go. Yeah, just, just throw it away. <laughs> if Christians would never struggle, they would just hear, obey, and make and be made whole, right? If there was never a struggle, we would just hear the voice of the Lord, we'd get up and obey Him. But it doesn't work that way. There's always there's a struggle. It's important to remember that God has power over Satan. And Jesus, listen to this, Jesus is the conduit. Just like I was talking about earlier, the handshake. Jesus and what he did at the cross is the connection that, that allows us to be connected to the power of God. The source of the Holy Spirit that wants to flood in and give us the help that we need. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that on this cross, you see, you were born like Adam and you were born in sin. You received sin from your father Adam in your first physical birth. I'm just talking to you about the Bible right now. When you were born in your, from your mother's womb, when you gushed forth in water in your natural birth, you were already a sinner. I don't care how cute you were. You, are, you had a sinful nature. Oh, I don't like that. Them words. Well, I'm, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And if you don't believe me, put, put two 15-month-olds in the same crib and give them one rubber ducky and step back and watch the show. Did you have to teach them that? No. I was already in them. Right. That's right. You got to teach them how to share. You got to teach them how, how to love. Yes. Amen. Amen. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that that's why you had to be born again. Amen. See, when you get born again, the old man that was born like Adam dies with Jesus at the cross. Yes. Yes. He's buried with Jesus in the tomb. I'm telling you what the Bible says. That's Romans chapter 6. Yes. The old man born like Adam it dies with Christ. He's buried with Jesus in the tomb. And a new man is resurrected to newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. That behold those that be in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. That's why I've always said it. And I will not shrink back. The, the AA is not the way. Now listen to me. I'm not here to fuss about people that are in the program. I was in three programs. I was in three rehabs by the time I was 19. This is just reality. But I'm here to tell you, AA ain't never set nobody free. Because you, know you know what the mantra of AA is? Let me just tell you, and this is contrary to the word of God. So you can, you, people can get mad at me if they want. If you're on video and you get mad, you can turn it off and tune in again next week. Sooner or later, you'll see what I'm talking about. It might be, hopefully it doesn't take five, ten years down the road. But this is what AA says. My name is Matt and I'm an alcoholic. Amen. I don't even have power. I guess I'm turned on. My name is Matt and I'm an alcoholic. Or my name is Matt and I'm a drug addict. That's not what the Word of God says. Hello. Word of God says my name is Matt and I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Word of God says my name is Matt and I was born like my daddy Adam. But I died in Christ and that old man was buried. And I've been resurrected to newness of life. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also bring life to my mortal body. Hallelujah. And now the enemy doesn't have power over me. That's the word of God. That's the message of the cross. You can put your faith in that. You can stand on the rock of that. And the Holy Spirit will move in that. The conduit through which he will flow to bring you freedom Hallelujah. and deliverance. Hallelujah. Just start walking. Yes. Start walking in the right direction. Amen. It's important to remember that God has power over Satan, like I was saying, and that Jesus is the conduit to, from which that power flows. These are some of the words that Jesus said. It is finished. Yes. The work is complete. And he said this in Matthew 11. He talked about the fact that the strong man has been bound. Yes. 
You know what that means? This earth, the strong man is the enemy. He said you can't spoil the goods out of a man's house. I know that this is kind of like, seems like a strange illustration. In other words, you're not going to go try to take another man's stuff unless you first make him sit down and duct tape him to the chair. Because <laughs> he might have a firearm and you might, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, they didn't have that back in Jesus's day, but that's the idea. The context of what Jesus is talking about is that the strong man is the enemy and his house is this earth because it's been plagued by the power of sin. No, he doesn't own this earth, but right now he has power over humanity because of the power of sin. But what Jesus has come to do is to bind the strong man. See, God's power is more powerful than Satan's power. He, sit down in that chair right there because there's coming a day when you're going to bow your knee too, liar. And on that day, you're going to be cast into a pit for a thousand years before you're thrown into the lake of fire. But in the meantime, my child, Vince, my child, Curtis, my child, Sabrina, they cried out and I heard their name. So in their little world where my kingdom lives in them, you sit down in that chair I'm about to duct tape you. Because you don't have any power over my children's lives because they're new creations in Christ. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit is going to bring freedom and liberty. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Again, God's more powerful than him. He kicked him out of there when he tried to rebel. He says, I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions. He was talking about demon spirits. Jesus has given us power over that. And all you got to do is believe. You just got to start believing in the right thing. Faith has to connect to the truth. And the truth says, I'm free in Christ. Hallelujah. The victory's already been won. Romans 8, 37. We're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Amen. But there's a spiritual place that we can be that would result in death. A place of darkness where we hang out. I'm just talking <laughs> theoretical. I'm talking spiritual. What are you talking about? Well, what is it that we keep doing to ourselves that keeps us in bound in that dark place? Whether it's certain kinds of behavior or certain places that we know. I've been in a bar room since I was a Christian. That's been a long time now, thank God. I think the last time I was in one was in 01. Well, that's not true. I walked in one for about five minutes to go look for somebody one time. But what I'm trying to say is when I was purposefully going into a bar room to do what people in bar rooms do. And you can do whatever you want with this. But I'm here to tell you, when you get saved and the Holy Ghost comes alive on the inside of your heart and you walk into a bar room, you're going to notice a definite difference in the atmosphere. They keep it dark like that on purpose. Because <laughs> guess what? People that are doing wrong things don't want their wrong things exposed. Light exposes it. That's just a... But when you stay in places like that, I'm just using ballroom as an example. It don't even have to be that. You'd be scrolling on your phone. Scrolling on your phone, connecting to the wrong stuff can keep you in a dark place. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. Go ahead, feed your spirit man that stuff. If that's what you choose to do. If that's what you want to do, don't let the preacher, oh, I don't like this preacher. Well, guess what? I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Anything that glorifies sin instead of God will keep you stuck in a dark place. There's a spiritual place that results in death and there's a spiritual place that results in life. And if you stay in the first, you will either slowly or quickly die. But if you move towards the second one, your healing begins. And as they walked, they were cleansed. As they walked, they were cleansed. Don't stay stuck in the dark place. Don't continue to go to the place that wants to hold you in bondage. Get up. And obey the word of the Lord with the help of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And move into the right direction. Amen. Where is that place? Well, the ultimate place is in Christ. When he died, he died for you. When you chose the new life he offered, the old you died with him so that the new you could live with him. Yes. And the new you is not a leper. Amen. 
The new you is not an alcoholic. The new you is not a is not an addict. The new you is not a lust fiend. The new you is not a leper. The new you is clean and free. But if you refuse to move to where he tells you to move, if you stay stuck in the place where you've always been, where the leprosy was eating away at everything you are, then you will die. Spiritually and maybe even physically. Prematurely. And therein lies the struggle. The battle of the wills. My will versus God's will. And when will I submit and start walking? Look at Jeremiah 6, 16. And listen, nowadays you got to be careful what church you go to. Can I, can I just be honest with you? In the days that Jesus was on the earth, there was false teaching. The Pharisees, those religious leaders I mentioned earlier, they weren't teaching the truth. In the days of Paul's writing, constantly the churches were being plagued by false doctrine. Can I tell you that it's worse now than it was then? Preachers have actually gotten better at hiding that. And they pretend that what they preach from the pulpit is actually the word of the Lord. And in reality, some of, some of what people are preaching keeps people in bondage. Because it changes the object of their faith and puts it on something that it's not even supposed to be. And many times people think that they're doing good with the Lord just because they're sitting in a fanny in a church on Sunday. And I got to tell you that just because you're sitting in the church on Sunday does not mean that we're doing right with the Lord. We got to understand that we got to have our faith right, trusting God that he's going to change us. And oh, this is old school preaching. That's right. We're going to continue to do it. Look at Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways. You know what a ways, the ways is? It's a bunch of crossroads. You ever been to Houston? Been a long time since I've been to Houston, but my daddy used to live in Houston. He called it the spaghetti bowl. Well, when you get past the spaghetti bowl, take a, the next exit. I don't like the spaghetti bowl. You'll know what I'm talking about, boy, when you see it, okay? And I mean, look, they got, they got, they're trying to sling you off in every direction. That's a modern day version of the ways. Back in the day, they probably had like four little cross sections on the road. But this is what it, the Lord told Jeremiah. Go stand in the ways. I want you to go look at all the different options of the direction that you can go. And whenever you go there, this is what I want you to do. I want you to ask for the old path. Yes. Huh. See, the old path is safe, child of God. Because the old path reminds us of what the word of God said. We don't have preachers tinkering around with the old path. We don't have men and women trying to say, oh, this is the word of the Lord. And we, and we water it down and we dilute it in such a way that it makes people feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. But it doesn't get to the bottom or the root of the problem. No, the Lord said, go back to the old path. Where is the good way? And when you find it, walk therein. And look at this, what's going to happen. See, isn't this something? The devil convinces people when they go into a church and the truth is preached. Oh man, I don't know if I like that because I want to feel, leave church feeling good about myself. I want one of them preachers that's going to make me feel good about myself. But look what the word of God said. When you find the old path, when you find the good way and you walk there and you're going to find rest for your soul. But they said this, we will not walk therein. See, the battle of the wills. If you want to stay a leper, you can stay a leper. God doesn't want you to stay a leper. He doesn't want me to stay a leper. He's saying, hey, this is where I need you to go. And now the battle of the wills ensues. And hopefully we come to that place. Lord, help us come to that place where in desperation we cry out, Lord Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. What has God asked you to do? Where has God asked you to go when he brought you to the crossroads? And he said, this is what I need you to do. He asked Naaman the leper in the Old Testament, go dip in the Jordan. And Naaman's like, oh, I don't want to dip in them dirty waters. But praise God, he did. Amen. And he came up clean. He told the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, pick up your bed and walk. You've been laying here for 38 years. I want to make you whole. But will you get up? And if you will, pick up your bed and you can walk out of here. Paint, some of the things God asks us to do, it's like, what does this even mean? He told him in the Exodus, paint the doorpost and the side post with blood. That was a type of Jesus. And when you get saved, him covering your heart with his blood. Lift up your rod. You remember when he told Moses that? Lift up your rod and stretch your hand over the waters. I wish that when we got here, the Lord would have had a boat waiting for us. It would have been it made so much sense after he brought us out of Egypt for him to have a boat right here. And you can sit there and you can be like, oh man, I ain't never going to get delivered out of this. I'm never going to get out of here. Lift up the rod, 
stretch your hand over. But that just seems silly. That people are going to laugh at me. No, trust God. Yes. Trust God, amen, in what He's asking you to do. And walk out over dry ground. The first thing I really wanted you to see about this passage is, I want to talk to you about unclean. He passed through Samaria. That's what it said. You remember that? He was on his way to Jerusalem. He passed through Samaria. I know I've taught this a lot. I'm not going to overdo it, but I just want to make the point. Let's just suffice it to say the Samaritans were considered unclean by the Jews. There's a long history behind that. We don't really have time, but it's a, but it's an unclean place. You know, God showed up and he delivered me in an unclean place. I had gone to an unclean place, but yet God showed up and he spoke a word to my heart. I just want you to know that God still shows up in unclean places. Amen. That's where the he, he will show up. He's not endorsing your our behavior. No. But when we get desperate and we cry out, he will show up in an unclean place and he will bring you out and he will deliver you. And these 10 lepers found themselves in a region that was considered unclean, but yet Jesus still would go there to find them so that he could set them free. Amen. And that's where they stood far off. That's where they lifted up their voices and they cried out for God to have mercy. One of the devil's greatest tactics is to overwhelm people with guilt and shame. He attacks people's minds and burdens their hearts by magnifying all their faults. Has that ever happened to you before? He, he magnifies your faults. He tries to weigh you down with condemnation and guilt. And when a person doesn't know the voice of God, they begin to think that the lies are truth. Lord, help us. We begin to think that the lies are truth. Hopelessness sets in. Darkness of clouds blanket the sky. Heaviness makes the heart sick. But hold on a second because Jesus is right around the corner. Hello. Jesus is right around the corner. Now, I don't know where you are and I don't know what kind of lies that the enemy has tried to whisper in your ear. But let me tell you something. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. The truth of God's word says that you can live. If you're hearing something about death ringing in your ears, that is not the word of the Lord. That is the lie of Satan. God has come to bring you life, come to bring you liberty. And when you hear lies from the enemy, you need to cry out and say, no, Lord, I want life. Have mercy on me. Yes, amen. I want you to consider the ten lepers. He goes to dark, he goes to unclean places. He did it for the man of Gadarene. He did it for the Samaritan woman. You know what I'm talking about? The man of Gadarene, y'all remember him? He was the man that was bound up with all them devils and he lived in the tombstones. And they tried to chain him up, but he'd break the chains because he was so full of demons and he'd cut himself and he'd howl at night. And they tried to help him, but man can't help that. They can't put you in no psychiatric ward and put a pill in your throat to set you free from demon spirits. It don't work that way. No, but Jesus will show up and he will bring deliverance. Yes. Yes. The next thing you know, they found that man sitting in his right mind. Ready to give glory to God. The Samaritan woman. He went and found her in an unclean place. Amen. Amen. And he delivered her out. Next thing you know, she got a testimony on her lips. She's like, I'll be back. I got to go tell these people in the village about the one that knew everything about me. Amen. And he did it for these ten lepers. You know, not only were they in an unclean place, but they themselves were unclean. There met him ten men that were lepers. They stood far off. They lifted up their voice and they said, Master, have mercy on us. You know, this is the epitome of social distancing. You got to understand something. That's why, that's why they stood afar off. They had leprosy. Leprosy, they didn't know exactly what it was back then. We've cured it now. It's a bacteria. But, but they were considered according to the law in the Old Testament to be unclean. They had to keep their social distance. They had to walk around and even say things like, unclean, unclean, so that you wouldn't accidentally get into their, their distant space. So they stood afar off and they said, help us, master, have mercy on us. You know the word mercy means compassion and pity. Lord, please have compassion on me. Please have pity on me. Well, they can cry out like that if that's what they want to do, but I'm too dignified to be pitiful. See, that's why I was trying to talk to you about the altar. Again, I'm not trying to coerce anybody. I'm just trying to make a point. There's great power that can be found in humility. When we walk around here, 
Like, you know, oh, I'm, you ain't never gonna see me cry. Oh, I'm, I ain't got no shame in my game. I'm hard as a rock. And yeah, but that ain't good. That might, that don't work good. Maybe if you, like, dad, you a Marine in Korea to get through that little year, but that's about all that'll do. I still don't even think that's gonna work. I need the Lord to protect me if I'm in war. Amen. Amen. It don't work like that. No, that's not how God works. God works different than the world. You might be able to put a whooping on somebody outside on the street, but guess what? You ain't going to whoop the devil like that. He will chew you up and spit you out. Leave you bleeding on the side of the road, my friend. I don't care how tough you think you are. Yeah, until a person realizes they're a leper, they won't cry out. They'll just think that their feelings of hopelessness and despair are just depression symptoms that they need to be quieted by a pill instead of realizing that they have a leprous disease called sin that has plagued their person, resulting in hopelessness and despair. And when they begin to see that, they begin to realize that there's only one thing that can help them. Jesus, Master, have compassion and pity and mercy on a poor sinner like me. See, whenever I call people sinners, you understand that I'm talking about myself. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The Bible repeatedly explains to us the way of cleansing. Listen, even in the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament point to the cross. I'm about to show you something. Throughout the Old Testament, the rituals pointed to a place where the ultimate cleansing would take place that brings me to point number two. I talked about unclean. Now I'm talking about there's only one answer for uncleanness. What did Jesus tell him? Go. Show yourself to the priest. I want to read a passage of scripture out of the Old Testament to you. I want to teach you something that I think is so beautiful that points to the cross. And I want you to see it with me. Look at Leviticus chapter 14 verses 1 through 7. Y'all ready? We're going to read some more scripture. It says in this passage of scripture, the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go forth out of the camp and the priest shall look and behold if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leprosy. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. When he told them that they still had leprosy, but they turned around and they started to walk and the word of God says, as they went, they were cleansed. So now that you're cleansed, you gotta, you gotta see the priest because the priest has to do his thing and give you permission to go back into society. But this is what has to happen. The priest shall command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean Cedar wood, scarlet, hyssop, all these are types of the, of the sacrifice. I don't have time to get into it completely. But look what happens. The priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Now let's think about this. They didn't have faucets and, and, and all that. But let's just imagine that they went to the water source and they got a pitcher of water. And there was a, there was a bowl. And in the bowl they put scarlet cedar wood and hyssop and then they took one of the live birds and basically what they did was somebody was pouring water and they wrung its neck and they allowed the blood to pour into the bowl along with the water and so now we got a bowl or a basin with all these little ingredients on the inside of there and a sacrifice of a bird that had just taken place as for the living bird verse 6 he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop. And he shall, burn, and he shall dip, the, dip them in the living and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. This is another illustration of kind of like the scapegoat. But listen, I just want to just just bear with me. Let's get the imagery in our mind. Here's a leper. He's he's been leprous. He's been had the social distance. His sin, if we could say it that way, has kept him separated from the presence of God because the leper wasn't able to go to the temple to worship the Lord. And so he's been separated from the presence of God. But now the Lord cleanses him. But in order but now, but how was he cleansed? Ultimately, the cleansing took place through this ritual. And here was an animal that was innocent. It was a type of the lamb. It was a type of Christ. And it died in place 
place of the leper and its blood was poured into this basin for the purpose of cleansing. And now the live bird, which represents you and represents me, was taken and was plunged. Listen to me. There's an old song that says plunged. I don't even remember the words plunged beneath the flow from Emmanuel's veins. In other words, the, the Emmanuel, God with us, his veins talking about the place where his blood once was, but instead now it was poured out for you. And as though it were collected in a basin, that sinners have been plunged into that flow that came from the veins of Jesus, that cleansing blood, the sacrifice, the cross of Jesus Christ, and that bird that represents you and me, he's plunged up under there. Well, I just imagine it in my mind. He's plunged up under there, and he's taken to an open field, and he's let go, and I can see that thing flapping, and all that bloody water flying off of him, but he's, free. he's flying to freedom. He said go, he's let, he set free to fly in freedom and liberty. And it all took place because of the cleansing of the blood. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is my last point. Will you just fly away and never come back? <laughs> you know, whenever the Lord sets you free. When you experienced the delivering power of the Holy Spirit. When you came to the place and you realized you were a leper. And you came to the place of desperation. And you cried out to the Lord. Hallelujah. And he plunged you beneath those cleansing waters. And he set you free. Will you just fly away and never come back? One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where's the other nine? You know, numbers have meaning in the Bible. And I don't want you to take this too literal. Yes. But I want to make a point. The two things that stuck out in my mind about the number 10 from the Bible was two, two main things. I'm not saying that there's not more, but these are the two that stuck out in my mind. The law, the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You understand that for Israel, the law was this. The law was their word. So the word of God. So number 10 representing the word of God, representing the character of God, right? And the tithe. You, did you know that the word tithe means 10? Oh, I knew it was coming. The preacher was going to preach on money. I'm not even talking about it in that sense. So calm down. All right. Is it biblical to pay your tithe? You better believe it. But that's not what I'm talking about. But what I will tell you about paying your tithe is this. If there's not one thing that the devil will fight you more, that you will try to hold on to and try to control more than anything else, is your money. Boy, don't try to take my money, preacher. I'm not trying to take your money. I'm here to tell you what the word of the Lord says. Your money, it ain't my money. I'm here to try to be faithful to God. But I'm telling you right now, when I first got saved, even after all that God has done for me, I'm still wanting to hold on to what I think is mine. But the word of God says it's not even yours. But do you believe that? See, that's the whole thing. Do you believe that it's not really yours? Do you believe that the breath in your lungs is not even yours? Do you believe that you truly were created by God whenever he created Adam out of the earth? Amen. And that you belong to him and that, now, and that he bought you with a price that he purchased you with his blood. The Bible says you are not his own. You were bought with a price. Do you believe that? Amen. Yes. Amen. I believe it. And so the least I can do is give him my money, <laughs> but I'm not preaching on money. I'm really not. I'm just trying to say that when you give a tithe, mm -hmm. that's a place of surrender. That's a way of, that is a way of worship, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it's a way of giving back to God. It's a way that I'm saying, I'm recognizing that you are God and I am man. I'm recognizing that you're the potter and I'm the clay. I'm recognizing that you're in charge and I'm the one that's supposed to submit. Hallelujah. And I see this one leper as a tithe. Yes. He's a tenth of the ten. He's the only one that came back. Mm -hmm. Jesus healed him. Jesus made him whole. And he's walking down the road going to show himself to the priest and he's like, what, what, what just happened? We got healed. We got healed of our leprosy. We got healed of our disease. We, we've been delivered. Oh, man, I'm going back. 
I'm going back. I'm going to give him my, I'm going to be the tithe. I'm going to go submit myself to the Lord. I'm going to go show my gratitude to him. Amen. Will you just fly away and never come back? Or when the Lord delivers you and he does a work, will your heart be filled with thankfulness and joy? Hallelujah. And when you allow that miracle that he's done in your life to bring glory to God. Yes. Amen. That's God's will for your life. I don't know what you do for a living, but that in and of itself is not God's will for your life. Yeah, he might have a will for your, for your occupation. He does. He has a perfect plan for your life. The minute details. He wants to position you in the right spot, but not so you can just be some CEO of a Fortune 500 company and make millions and millions of dollars. I mean, if he gives you that job, praise God, that was the plan that he had for your life. But if you're not giving glory to the Lord, you've missed your purpose on earth, child of God. Yeah. And if you thought it was to drive some big fancy car and have a bank account full of money or to have a bunch of degrees that you can put on the wall to show everybody how smart you are, you missed it. Yeah. If he delivered you and he set you free, will you come back, amen, to give him yes. glory? Yes. Can I get Yvette and... Can y'all come up and sing that song? We're going to go out of here singing that song one more time. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit. We're going to let the Holy Spirit know that He's welcome in this place. Amen. You know, I read through the story how the Pharisees went to Jesus and wanted to know when the kingdom of God will come. And you remember Jesus' response was that you won't observe the coming of the kingdom with your eyes. At least I believe what he was saying was you're not going to see it the way you're expecting to see right. it. But I got to tell you that sometimes you can see the kingdom of God with your eyes. And what I'm talking about is, is that this tenth of a leper. That's an observation right there. I mean, what I'm saying is, is that the word Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. And when the kingdom of God affected that leper and he was cleansed, you, everybody that was on that pathway was able to observe. I don't know exactly how it went down because the Bible doesn't tell me. But I would imagine that if they were all screaming, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. And that when they got down that road and they realized that let's just pretend that there were some people around. I don't know. And they, then they realized that they were no longer lepers. Surely they were kind of excited. Right. They probably had like a celebration. Hallelujah. I'm not a leper no more. Amen. And I once said, well, let's go back and tell him. Let's go back and thank him. He gave us our life back. Let's go back and thank him. And like, man, you can go do that, dude. I'm good. I'm going back to the priest. He told me to go to the priest. I'm going to go to the priest so that I can go back to see my people, so that I can get back out there in society, so that I can go do my do my thing. And that one leper's like, well, I'm going to go there too because he told me to go there. But first, I'm going back to him. Yeah, I'm going back to him and I'm going to give him glory. Yeah. I'm going back to him and I'm going to tell him that I'm grateful and that I'm thankful. I want to encourage you, church. I want to encourage you, child of God. God wants to do a work in your heart and in your life. And the reason that he really wants to do it, and don't think that he's, I'm going to use a big word, narcissistic. But he wants to get glory. See, some people are like, well, what kind of God is that? All he's worried about is getting glory. Yep, yeah, because he's worthy. But, but it's even bigger than that. Because even in his glory, he's humble. How? Because the reason he wants to be glorified is so that another person can get the light put in him. See, when the leper goes back and gives glory to Jesus and the people that are around there at that point in time, now they get to see what he did in them. Yes, and then now they have hope. Now they have hope to whenever they find themselves in darkness that they can cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. But if we never go back and thank him, if we never are willing to submit our life back to Him, then all those people that need it might not ever know. Let's go out worshiping the Lord. The altars are always open, but we're going to worship God together. Amen.